Good morning. Welcome to the East Asia Regional Session. Um, we may be having more people coming in uh, from the coffee area because it's not allowed inside, but uh, we'll be starting so we don't accumulate too many delays. So very briefly, um, we're going to have the first session before the coffee break about Mongolian showcases, technologies and business uh, models. With me, I'm going to be presenting about the Northeast Asia Supergrid, so-called NAPSI. But with me, it's Ulsi Bayar Sandang. He's going to be speaking about the first battery um, storage system for the grid in Ulaanbaatar for the central energy system. We also have Gambat Ekhyabar the, from the National Dispatch Center. He's going to be speaking about a project we are supporting to develop the current grid into a smart grid or smart energy system. Um, we have Neil Young from Elixir Energy, who is going to be speaking about a feasibility study of uh, producing green hydrogen and exporting it to, to northern China. And then finally, we'll have Bad Batar Mungung Hishi, who is the country director for um, People in Need, an NGO in Mongolia. And he'll be speaking about an uh, experience that they have with the GER community with ecron friendly um, energy efficient cooking, heating, and insulation for girls. So five presentations. After each presentation, which is around 10 to 12 minutes, we're going to be having a quiz on Menti. So we're going to show a barcode, and you're going to scan it, and then you answer the questions. And then the best three of those questions will get some souvenirs. <laughs> OK, so please get to those barcodes. And uh, we'll have also a Q&A session after the presentations, hopefully 10 to 25 minutes, and then coffee break at 10.30. And after that, my colleague Lei, who is sitting at the front, will be presenting the second session, who is going to be showcases about uh, our experience in China. So without further ado, and because we are already late, as usual, we're going to start with the first presentation, which is actually mine. So let's go with it. Let me see. Yeah, this one already. Okay, so um, can you put in zero the the clock so I can measure myself? Um, NAPSI is the Northeast Asia Power System Integration, and it's something that we've been supporting since 2015. Why NAPSI? Well, essentially, um, Gateco, which is the Global Energy Integration Development Cooperation Organization set up in 2016, has had this idea which has been put in practice because a lot of uh, power companies uh, want to integrate. They know that larger integration of power grids brings larger stability. You share resources better, grids more stable, you have a good backbone. Um, this is their idea to connect the world with uh, backbone transmission uh, lines that will integrate uh, the different uh, power systems. That doesn't mean they're synchronized, they're just connected. So they're able to channel power back and forth. This is the global view, but regionally, we had some experience in uh, Europe. The clock's in zero. Um, and we have the, the European grid interconnection system. And as you can see, there are all these little um, uh, lines drawn all over. Those are main transmission lines that are going to be doing the power trade. Uh, most of them are HVDCs. Um, because in Europe, currently, we only have uh, four systems. That, uh, we have four um, synchronized, uh, synchronous grids. They are not synchronized the whole Europe, but only four of them are synchronized. Um, the continental Europe, the Nordic countries, UK, which is connected only through EHV with, with France and uh, the Baltic countries. So interestingly, and probably arguably, Europe was the first one doing power trade. Uh, the first one in 1915 between Denmark and Sweden. Later, after the Second World War, more countries got connected. And currently, we have the whole uh, continent uh, connected and, and actually integrated. So they're able to do power trade and also power flows will be back and forth to stabilize grids. So what happens in Asia? In Asia, there are different areas, different regions, um, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, Central, South, 
well, the Middle East is not part of our ADB business, but it's also part of um, Asia, so we put it in the map. And essentially, the idea is to have those areas which have some economic cooperation already, like, for example, the GMS, the Great Mekong sub-region. They are looking also at connecting um, through the Southeast Asia supergrid. Central Asia, they have the Karek. In South Asia, they have Sasek, and, and so on and so forth. So the idea is to have that economic cooperation also integrated through power system uh, integration and power system and power trade. Uh, ADB has been supporting some of these uh, interconnections. Um, there is an HVDC that uh, ADB finance between India and Bangladesh, 500 uh, kilo, kilowatts power. And then uh, there is an HVAC connected at 400 uh, kilovolts uh, between Laos and Vietnam. So why uh, supergrid in Northeast Asia? Why do we want to do this? So the idea is that we have plenty of uh, clean energy, no, uh, renewable energy resources in the region. As you can see from the two maps, solar resources and wind resources are very strong where the red areas. The red areas fortunately cover part of Mongolia, which is why it explains the rationale behind NAPSI. And also, and obviously, Northeast Asia have three very large economies, China, Japan, and Korea. We have plenty of renewable energy resources, even though they are not that distributed. But Mongolia, as I mentioned, have plenty of those resources and are able to export them if they have the infrastructure to do so. And then that covers also the, the, what the World Energy Council calls the energy trilemma. Um, a balance between energy security, environmental sustainability, and energy equity. So as you can see, Japan ranks in, within near Northeast Asia among the top on the 19th uh, rank. Then Korea 22nd, PRC is the 40th, and the last one is 66th is Mongolia because of the equity and environmental sustainability, which as you can imagine, coal is not uh, very high in the ranking. So what uh, IDB has been doing with this uh, NAPSI? So in 2015, um, with funding from different sources, um, it was developed the strategy for the North Asia, Northeast Asia power system integration, which part of the output, this is a scenario three, it's a high voltage transmission system that will connect different areas. Most importantly will be the ones from Southern Mongolia, as you can see in the map, connecting um, Northern China. From there, from their grid, from the North China grid will connect to Korea and from Korea to Japan. There is also some plans to build from Russia to Japan directly and also um, connecting uh, Mongolia to Russia and having kind of the integration of all these countries through high voltage transmission. The feasibility study and the models, I, these are only models, okay, these are on paper. The expectations are that once this is built, um, there will be a $10 billion annual savings because of this integration and expected 210 million tons of CO2 equivalent reductions. But this is assuming 100 gigawatts of solar and wind renewable energy from South Gobi being traded through those through this transmission system. 100 gigawatts, it's a lot of uh, capacity, a lot of infrastructure that is not built yet. The key outputs of the TA, as you can see, are net benefits, but only if the renewable energy is developed. Concept of the HV uh, grid has been created at both national and the uh, whole region levels. So there is a pre-feasibility study in place out of this um, TA. And then also this TA had some um, wind and solar mapping to confirm whether the resources are available and where and whether we can maximize uh, that uh, renewable resource. The figure shows uh, different models and the timing, whether in 2020 we have 0 0.3 gigawatts built, the objective is to have 100 by 2036, and the different connections and power traders between the different regions. Oh, okay, <laughs> I thought there was nothing here. Um, also the TA showed um, some area where the renewable energy is, is uh, concentrated 
In the map, you will see Southern Mongolia, which is Gobi Desert. You have all that uh, solar resource. And then you have some of the uh, blue areas that are going to be the wind resource. And then it shows the, the drawings of the expected HVDCs transmission lines and the capacity um, for gigawatt um, and then uh, five and, and four, de depending on the regions. You'll see all these connections. The lines in the middle of Mongolia, this is part of the central energy system that is, but is built, but it's going to be completed as well, uh, assuming these investments come through. There is also expectation of having an underwater connection from China to Korea rather than going obviously through North Korea, which is not uh, feasible at the moment. So after this TA, there were some focus on priorities that ADB supported. And there are these three. Um, sorry, I don't know why this is not showing. There are some uh, fonts in white, that's why we cannot read them. But essentially, it's going to be talking about um, system uh, establishing a secretariat for the NAPSI uh, without actual an actual group of people working full time on, on this is not going to happen. Bilateral deals are not going to build the regional integration system. So the idea is to set up with support from ADB and other donors, um, particularly those from Japan, Korea, and also China can participate in terms of um, um, as, as a donor um, to set up a secretariat with the collaboration of other multilaterals as well, including the UNSCAP. Um, also, advancing investments, this is the core. Um, how to have 100 gigawatts, it requires a lot of money, not only public finance, not only concessional finance, but a lot of private sector investments are needed. The idea is to have all these investments listed here, but not only investments for infrastructure as well, setting up the right regulatory environment, uh, standards, uh, and all that, th those things that need to happen in parallel. And then finally, preparing for a permanent multilateral coordination framework. This is uh, part of the idea from the multilaterals. We want to be involved as a buffer, as well as a deal maker in between the different parties. So we try to maximize benefits for everyone, not only for the large players. Um, for base case, um, the most simpler one will be having Mongolia as the seller country, they will be generating the renewable power and they will be exporting it to the, the purchasing countries. Initially, it's going to be only PRC because it's the, the, the closest border. And then it's going to be the transmission system operator is going to be selling to the transmission system operator of North Mongolia, which is the North Star State Grid. And through PPAs, uh, maybe some joint ventures in between the power grids to buy, to operate and manage those common links. But this ideally will be in the future advanced towards a more developed option where you're going to have selling to PRC, but also to South Korea. And even though it's not drawn here, it will go also to Japan in the end. Also, Russia is part of the seller country because you would be able to channel power from the hydropower in the north of Mongolia through Mongolia to PRC and Korea. Activities under the second NAPSI, which is currently being uh, implemented. Um, there are four. Essentially, we are looking again, scenarios for building five gigawatts of renewable energy in South Gobi. We are doing some mapping, some resource uh, assessments, um, essentially selecting where would be the best locations and how to connect them to the different, um, you know, cross-border interconnections to China. Um, the Mongolia-China interconnection is going to be also looking at which type of technology, what are the routing options, whether there is an integration of that domestic grid at 220 kV and, and synchronization or not, and the different models to, to, to measure power flows. Then business cases in terms of economic and financial analysis, uh, CapEx estimation, OPEX estimation, how would be those PPAs structured, um, what are the landed power costs at different market prices? So essentially you do a comparison whether it all makes sense. And finally, a contextual evaluation, which is how are we going to be linking PRC to Korea? What are the regulatory uh, requirements to have 
two different power systems with different standards, how we're going to be able to manage them together. Um, so we don't have only, it's not only the technical, but it's also the regulatory way of looking at it, different uh, grid codes and everything else that need to happen also in parallel with infrastructure. And this is the end of my presentation. Uh, these are the questions you're going to be answering through the quiz. I'm assuming we have the barcode already or the QR. Thank you. Cheers, yeah. Bajar la va. How do I show the quiz? So take out your phones, please. We're going to have a QR code showing in the screen very soon. And then you're going to have, I think, 16 seconds per question. And then you mark whatever. These are four uh, possible answers. Only one is correct. And then the best of the students will get some prizes. Guys, QR code or we move to the next slide. Apologies for the hiccups. We don't have it, right? The QR code. Do we have it? We have it. Ah, okay, so we have it. That's uh, good news. <laughs> we just have to show it. <laughs> there you go. Um, what is this? We don't have images, but anyway. This is the QR code. It's not the largest one. Are you able to scan it? Yeah. 17 already. Come on, guys. Don't be shy. We have prices only for three, though. <clears throat> First one was CC, yeah?
Okay, hello everyone. My name is Kambat. I'm from Mongolia and now I'm going to tell you about the Mongolian power system current situation and what we are planning to do for our penetration of renewable energy and uh, Okay, we have to wait. Okay, uh, we are planning to make uh, our power system integrate with modern technologies and it will give us uh, ability to dis automatic dispatching and make a, our grid very stable and uh, ADB give us a support to make a, a planning and feasibility study on a transition to a smart grid. So uh, Mongolian power system it has uh, some challenges, which are our country is very rapidly developing. So our electricity demand is uh, goes uh, increasing very high, and but we have no uh, enough power generation, and also our power plants and substations, all the infrastructure is aging and most of power plants are older than 40 years uh, also we our power system is connected to russian power system and we are very highly dependent from russia so and also our uh, interconnection line has a limited the capacity so it's a very uh, difficult give us the very difficulty so and uh, Mongolia is we are developing power grid plan to improve the uh, power system reliability uh, because of uh, now in Mongolian power system I think uh, 20 about 20 percent is renewables that so and renewables give us a uh, uh, very unstable situations always in every day, mostly because of uh, wind and wind forecast is about uh, seventy percent, and we can't dispatch uh, renewables optimally, and we have to reduce energy losses, and uh, therefore we can increase the renewable energy penetration to Mongolian power system. And uh, we, uh, Alfredo mentioned that uh, Mongolia has a, a very vast of renewable energy potential in the Southern area, but, uh, and also we have, uh, Mongolia has a long-term planning document, which is vision 2020. There are, we wrote that in 2000, Thirty, we will uh, increase penetration of renewables up to thirty percent of the um, power system capacity, and uh, our and also we have not have enough uh, information and communication infrastructure, and we have to increase. That is the our disadvantage currently it's, uh, give us uh, we have no ability to control and no and also can't make uh, a proper decision making to real time dispatching and uh, our project consists of four parts which is upgrade the SCADA. Our SCADA is installed in 2006 and it has no technical support from manufacturer. And now we, and also this SCADA is now working on uh, monitoring, just monitoring, no control, uh, just 
the data collecting and monitoring. And we have to install new SCADA and have, um, then we can uh, control and give us uh, a very optimum operation on power system. And we have, and second one is the uh, extension of OPGW network. Uh, OPG and now Mongolia has about 1,000 1, kilometer long OPGW. It will be increased up to 5,000. Then we can increase that you know, and increase the data collection and our uh, ability to real-time dispatching. And we now we are using wide area monitoring system. A warm system gives us the see the current situation of power system and uh, analyze the every disturbance of the grid. And now we uh, most of power plant is not connected to WAMS, only the biggest power plant, the two biggest power plants and uh, 10 biggest substations. Now we have to connect uh, most of substations and all of the power plants connect to WAMS, then we can make uh, and analyze the every uh, difficult situations and every disturbance, then our power system will be more stable. And also we are in, have to change and increase, uh, have to update our metering system to install more smart meters and uh, and use install uh, use uh, advanced metering infrastructure. Um, smart grid will bring uh, some advent um, some benefits uh, follow benefits to our power system, which is the improved reliability and security of the grid, because most most of our power plants and substations not connected to the network uh, uh, internet, internet or kind of IT network, they are on operation on manually. That is the very big disadvantage. And it and also smart grid give us the ability to reduce the cost and optimum operation and maintenance and increase the efficiency of our grid. And also, it most uh, focal point is increase the penetration of uh, incoming penetration of renewable energy resources. This is the main point, and uh, then the, therefore we can increase our integration to uh, Asian uh, integration to China or other countries. So there is uh, mostly the challenge is the cost of implementation because it's the uh, modern technologies are uh, not that cheap. And also we have no any standard for a smart grid in Mongolia. And, and we are trying to uh, translate some IEC standards and doing some research also. Okay. Uh, we hope that a smart grid project will give us the significant impact on our power grid. It will be our power system more reliable, more, more efficient, more transparent, and also creates the new opportunity to uh, for our renewable energy resources. And power grid is the very vital investment to the future of country's energy sector. So, okay, thank you.
All right, um, we're going to do again the QR code thingy with Menti. Um, more questions? Um, hopefully it happens within a few seconds. <clears throat> There you go. Not sure whether you have to scan again or not. Should be the same code because it's the same, um, the same ranking. Read carefully, this is a bit tricky. Very good, thanks a lot. It's been fun, this quiz thing. Um, with us, we're going to have now Mr. Chandan. He comes from the NPTG, the, the power uh, utility uh, from Mongolia. He's going to be talking about the project that ADB supported, the first battery, uh, utility scale battery storage system that is connected to the central energy system grid. So Mr. Chandan, please. Floor is yours. Greetings. My name is Gulciba Irtsandam. I, I work as uh, head, depart uh, head of the dispatching department at National Power Transmission Grid Company. Of Mongolia, I have I have been involved with the first utility scale energy storage project that is being implemented in Mongolia. So I, today I uh, we're glad to talk about very important project. 
Now, firstly, by implementing this project, we are aiming to install in beginning the operation of battery energy storage system. So this will be uh, the first time that Mongolia will be installing in operation battery energy storage system. So it is very landmark project to Mongolian energy system. Go into the detailed information uh, the project, the battery energy storage system in, in short in the base will have installed power 18 megawatts and capacity 200 megawatt hours. One of the main benefits of the project to increase the electricity supply, the Mongolian energy system. Precisely, uh, it will be increasing the electricity supply in the central energy system grid. The central energy system grid covers in the major load demand centers, including Ulaanbaatar, the uh, capital of Mongolia. So this uh, grid system accounts for the majority of Mongolians' electricity demand all year round. Uh, and the demand is still increasing. So it is important that will be increasing the electricity supply. As in the first years uh, in the government of Mongolia has been taking many steps to increase the renew renewable and clean energy sources. By implementing this project, clean energy source will be increased. So this is also one of of the benefits of the project. So as for the finding, and the project is mainly financed by AD, ADB, Asian Development Bank loan. As we can see, the government of Mongolia and high level technology fund also provided some of the funds below is the cost components so far. Next in uh, terms, we plan to complete the installation of the battery energy storage system by November of the, this year. Uh, yes, this year. The system is, will be installed in Songun Harkham district, Lambatar city. Concerning uh, the outcome of the project, it is estimated that uh, renewable energy capacity will be increased to 20% of the total generation capacity by 2023. More with the base will supply in 58 gigawatt hours of clean energy and, uh, and supporting the integration in, of the additionally 859 gigawatt hours of renewable electricity into the central energy system grid annually. Additionally, after the system is installed, we have a look uh, to look at in operation and the maintenance site. The project will be help to restrict the, the capacity of the National Dispatch Center to handle the power dispatch and grid operation. It will be also help uh, the national power transmission grid and sustainably operate and maintain the base. And the output in the project is to develop operation and maintenance regulations to avoid reducing battery life in overcharging and discharging. Now I want to briefly talk about the current implementing status of the project. The project is beginning, uh, the project management unit was created in July 22. After unit was created, the selection of the constructor was organized. After one year in July in 2021, we selected in RWA Technology Interest International as your main consulting company, this project. In 2022, we entered in, into contract with CTT and ZIST. 
a Chinese consortium as a contractor for the construction work. Uh, in August in 2022, a kickoff meeting was organized between the relevant parties. Soon in September, and the design work started. Finally, just two months ago in April, in construction work in the history system has begun. We are planning in finalizing construction work in coming November. Uh, here we can see project organization structure. The Ministry of Energy is the exciting agency while in the National Power Transmission Grid is implementing agency. Uh, a project steering committee consists of the, all this organization is shown here on the slide. The, including the Ministry of Energy, the Minister of Finance, and Energy Regulatory Commission, the National Dispatch Center and National Power Transmission Grid Company. The project management unit is responsible and for managing and supervising the project implementing. The project can really have manifold outcomes on different levels. For the grid systems, it will be helpful in increasing the generation capacity. On the social side, it's uh, beneficial and for the household, consumers, and business in urban areas powered by the central energy system grid. For the environment, in uh, the project is of the ways that renewable energy absorption will be increased. Here we can see general structure facility. Well, we still, we connected uh, to the 110 kW bus power of the Songul substation through the uh, 110 kW overhead line. Next detail the information of the battery storage, also in a single uh, diagram shown here. Lastly, we can see in detail the information of the key production of the battery energy storage system. To conclude, the, the best project, it's very beneficial landmark project to Mongolia and Mongolia energy system. So I will hope to successfully finish in implementation of look upon and experience to implement all the clean energy and renewable energy projects. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, hope you enjoy the presentation. More Menti questions. Um, and after that, we have only two left. One about uh, green hydrogen, another one about clean heating for gar communities. All very different business lines, but very interesting. Let's go with the questions. Um, these are for um, the presentation that you just saw. Uh, some of them are quantitative. You'll be looking at numbers. Hope you remember what you just saw. Um, let's see if the questions show. Okay, first question. How many hours could the battery energy storage system last at full 80 megawatt capacity of this charge? You may calculate that if you remember the capacity megawatt hours. It's 200 megawatt hours, right? So it should be two and a half hours. Second question.
how much is the period expected to cost? 80, 115, 150, or 195 million dollars? This is not only the loan, this is the whole project cost, including grants and government investment. One fifteen, one hundred million dollar loan, but the one fifteen is the total. Well, we have a new Earthman, <laughs> strawberry. Last question. What are some of the outcomes expected from this project once uh, it starts operating? Increase grid capability to absorb renewables, cleaner supply of renewable energy at the central system, enhanced power supply stability, or all, the, all of the above. That was an easy one. <laughs> all right, very good. So we're going to have with us now uh, Neil Young from Elixir Energy. He's the CEO, um, and they just developed a very interesting project in Southern Mongolia and about how produce green hydrogen and export it through a pipeline to, the, to China. So Neil, floor is yours, and tell us the story. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Neil Young. I'm the CEO of Elixir Energy. We are an Australian listed company. i uh, been working in Mongolia for more than a decade on a natural gas project, but uh, in recent years we've been developing a green hydrogen project. So we brand named this Gobi H2. It's Mongolia's first green hydrogen project that is one produced from renewable electrical energy sources. Uh, we developed the idea a number of years ago, and then we were very pleased to bring in a major Japanese partner last year, then a subsidiary of SoftBank Group, who've been working in Mongolia for a number of years. Uh, that is now being sold down to Toyota's trading house, Toyota Sushu, who owns 85% uh, of that entity. Uh, we procured a PFS study uh, earlier this year, which gave us confidence to progress our partnership, and we look to enter into a binding joint venture later this year. Now, in neighboring China, green hydrogen infrastructure has been moving apace, including the development of a regional pipeline system. We believe this can be extended northwards. So here we see a map of southern Mongolia and northern China. Uh, we believe that the location of this project provides ready access to the potential hydrogen markets in China. Uh, now, China's a big country. Why does it need imports? Well, we commissioned a study from Reistat Energy, which concluded that the scale of Chinese net uh, zero ambitions was such that they would need to import and that this location would be strongly advantaged. Now, a few months ago, we saw Sinopec announce the uh, 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 construction or, or, or at least a project for a 400 kilometer hydrogen pipeline connecting Inner Mongolia to coastal energy markets uh, in China. We believe that regional infrastructure can naturally be extended northwards in due course. So the requirements for success in a hydrogen project we've outlined here. Firstly, you need high quality renewable resources. And we've heard earlier, Mongolia has amongst the best in the world. Then the cost of installation, here you're next door to the suppliers of panels and turbines. Uh, now, uh, hydrogen to be, have any point must be green, it must be certified to be green in our project we consider would be. Now the fourth point, proximity to market. This is the key advantage. Hydrogen is very difficult and expensive to move and being next door to the market is fundamental to success. Now operational skills, we and our partner have been working in Moya, Mongolia for a number of years. Energy projects require government and stakeholder engagement, and that, that's something that we both bring. 
Now, access to capital, we're, we're an equity provider. Australia is quite good at funding early stage high risk projects, but the, the lighter layers of capital would come from the likes of the ADB and the EBRD, who are uh, well placed in Mongolia and who've been working with closely on this project. And as we've heard over the last few days, their mandate is very much to support the energy transition of, of which hydrogen is considered by most to be a key component. Lastly, scalability, our initial plans are to undertake a pilot, but the scale of the renewable resources in Mongolia on one hand, and then the scale of the potential demand in China on the other hand, are such that gigawatt scale projects are eminently uh, feasible, and that can be multi-gigawatts. So I mentioned hydrogen delivery costs. Uh, here we have a graph that we commissioned again from Rystad which compares the cost of moving hydrogen by boat in the form either of liquid hydrogen or by ammonia, then rendered back into hydrogen at destination versus pipeline and truck. And what we can see is that the costs of moving hydrogen by boat are enormously expensive. Now to render it into comparative energy terms, moving methane by boat has been undertaken for more than 50 years. It costs around $5 a gigajoule or an MMBTU to move that uh, 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 methane from places like Australia to places like China. Now, the cost of moving the same unit of energy in the form of hydrogen or ammonia is about four or five times more expensive. Uh, however, the cost of moving hydrogen by pipeline from an advantaged location like Mongolia is a fraction of that, probably more like a dollar, a couple of dollars a gigajoule. So that provides a competitive advantage, which is almost impossible to eclipse. And we believe that Mongolia can supply H2 hydrogen to China uh, by pipeline markets. Won't go into the detail of this. What we've undertaken here is to compare the combined renewable energy resources in the South Gobi compared to other places which have been identified by major parties as potential hydrogen manufacturing zones. And now the key to Mongolia's advantage is not only superb wind and good solar, it's a combination of the two. The combination not only in, in a day where you have the day-night rhythm of solar and wind, but also the combination over a year whereby solar and wind can vary clearly with seasons uh, uh, of various types. And here we get an electrolyzer capacity factor of the best location that we have found in the world based on public sources. Now, maybe there are better, but that's, that's the one that we've found to date. So we commissioned a PFS from uh, ACOM. Uh, this looked at uh, initial pilot project with a 10 megawatt uh, electrolyzer capacity and the wind and solar components that would go into that. It also had a small grid component that's very important to economics on, on green hydrogen at this scale. When one gets to gigawatt scale projects, the, the grid connectivity uh, issue will be of a different order of magnitude. Now the key conclusion here, there are no technical issues that would, that would impede this project. The, the issues are solely commercial. Um, and like every hydrogen project in the world of which uh, you know, there are plenty, uh, the key is finding a customer and uh, customers are rather harder to find, but we are engaging with a number of parties in both Mongolia and the PRC on that front. Now this is a green project. A lot of so-called green hydrogen projects that you see around the world with strong degrees of, of grid, grid connectivity are not green, they're basically brown. Uh, regulations are evolving to, to deal with that, but the small degree of grid connectivity here allows under the various uh, global regimes for this to be determined as being green. Now, the, the costs of hydrogen and what you see many numbers published in the media, um, they're basically commercial in confidence until hydrogen becomes a commodity market, which uh, uh, is many, many years away, if ever, given its uh, difficulties in moving. So I, I spoke about uh, certification again. Uh, I won't go into too much detail on this slide. Um, there are various jurisdictions that are rapidly evolving their green certification requirements, uh, uh, states, Europe, China being the main ones. Uh, the, the key is that a project should add to, to renewable capacity in the world rather than just uh, call upon fossil fuel demand. And uh, our project uh, certainly meets that criteria. So a question is easily begged, in particular, given the context of the presentation on NAPSI that we heard earlier, and that is, 
uh, uh, why not just move energy by uh, DC transmission lines rather than by rendering uh, that electricity into hydrogen then moving it by a pipeline? Uh, well, our analysis indicates that in, at least in energy efficiency terms, it is more efficient to actually render electricity into hydrogen, then move it by pipeline, then use it, rather than to move the electricity and then at the customer location, convert that into hydrogen and use it then. Now, clearly there are economic considerations as well and, and political ones. And just on, on the political side, clearly the, the NAPSI project, which we heard about earlier, requires governments to cooperate, whereas what we see as being one of the advantages of a hydrogen project in this location is that it can be private sector to private sector and then be built organically rather than be hostage to political timetables. So the South Gobi region is, is uh, uh, known to be the host of one of the world's major deserts, i.e. the Gobi Desert. And that obviously begs the question, where are you gonna get your water from to make your green hydrogen? And uh, 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 we believe we can answer that question. Now, firstly, the volumes of water required for hydrogen are not that material compared to traditional existing industrial activities such as mining and coal-fired generation, which use an awful lot of water. Now, the, the Gobi is semi-arid, but it's certainly not the Sahara Desert. There are very substantial groundwater resources as illustrated by their utilization by uh, local mining operations. So the largest mine in the region, Oyotogoi, is licensed to use one ton per second of water. Um, that, that water, if used for a hydrogen project, would need about $20 billion worth of investment. Um, that uh, is not a limiting factor at all. Now also, and to, to put it uh, fairly bluntly for a nation which exports coke and coal just now, hydrogen will only have a role if coke and coal demand goes down, and that would free up the water currently used in those operations for, for hydrogen. Now, to demonstrate two stakeholder water's availability, we've drilled a few water wells. And uh, to be honest, it's not hard to find on, on relatively modest cost uh, water in the region. Now, ultimately, water isn't an engineering issue. It's a political issue. Uh, local communities need to be persuaded that uh, projects such as hydrogen projects or any resource project can benefit them and not damage the environment. And uh, accordingly, project proponents need to invest in education and community support, which, which we do. So project summary, the two main drivers of success in hydrogen are quality of renewable energy resources. We believe we've got some of the best in the world, if not the best that we've found. Secondly, and critically, proximity to market. So with those two factors, we believe Gobi H2 is world-class. It's got a strong partnership in ownership. Uh, it meets screen criteria. And ultimately we see that moving uh, uh, energy through hydrogen uh, and pipelines is more energy efficient than moving it through DC transmission lines. And we see an emerging regional hydrogen pipeline grid, which could be readily extended northwards from its uh, primary location at present in, in the Chinese province of Inner Mongolia to Mongolia itself. So that's it. Thank you very much. How are we doing? Sleepy? We are just one presentation away from the coffee break, so bear with us. Uh, thanks, Neil, for the presentation. Um, NAPSI and this project can work together. It is not a substitution. <laughs> there is plenty of resources to, to move. Can be through power lines, can be through pipe, um, hydrogen pipelines. Um, the energy transition will accommodate all this. It's just a matter of money rather than engineering concerns. Uh, the engineering, I think, is there already. Right, so three questions on Menti for this presentation. Get ready, read carefully. Some of the questions are made on purpose to fail. So if all are easy, it would be too many presents to give away. We don't have that, that many. So. Okay, question. Outside Gobi Desert in Mongolia, what are the best combined renewable energy capacity factors 
for hydrogen production. Chile, Australia, China, the USA. Almost uh, at the Kama Desert, they have good stuff there. Next. What is the lowest technology to transport hydrogen gas to gas over short distances below 5,000 kilometers? By trucks, by pipeline gas, shipping liquefied hydrogen or shipping ammonia. By pipeline, as mentioned by Neil, and there was the graph where the cutoff for shipping and pipeline would be around 5,000 kilometers. Third question, what are the key requirements for the success of a hydrogen project? You can read the requirements there and choose. It was fairly easy, yeah? <laughs> yes, all of the above. It was a mix, mix of all the requirements listed in the presentation. All right. Um, last but not least, we have with us Mushi. Please come already. Uh, he's going to presenting about um, their experience with people in need organization on supporting their communities in Mongolia through clean cooking, energy, and insulation for the GERS. If you don't know what a GER is, you'll see some pictures there. Very interesting stuff. If you ever go to Mongolia, please try them. It's very interesting. All right, so Moshi, please. We have to welcome him. He just landed three hours ago uh, from uh, Ulaanbaatar. No sleep on the plane, so please be kind with him. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. Magandang um, uh, Good morning to everyone here in the room. Um, my name is Mungu Hishubat Patro, or you can just call me Moshi. Uh, it is true, Alfred, as Alfredo said, I've just landed here and changed into this clothes in the taxi and just entered this hall. So let's see how this goes. <laughs> um, so before starting this presentation, I would like to acknowledge our partners, the government of Mongolia, STC, UNICEF, MUST, uh, Mongolian Sustainable Financing Association, and then I work for the organization called People in Need. Okay, so let us talk about our whys and the reasons as to why we are working in the energy sector. And to me personally, even for most Mongolians, I would say the most immediate reason would be air pollution. Obviously there is the economic driving factor, etc. But for me and for us in the development world, we would like to think of uh, air pollution as the main driver of why we are working in the sector and what. So uh, if you could see from here briefly, from 2011 to 2018, uh, you will see the number of days in percentage where the PM concentration exceeded the acceptable level. And this is not WHO guidelines, this is the national standards. Um, and if you take a look at the recent years, 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022, we have some, seen some decrease in uh, air pollutants, but uh, we have also seen some increase in, especially in sulfur. As you could see, this is uh, where I live, uh, where the most Mongolians live, actually. The more than half of the population live in the capital city of Lambatar. And uh, this is where we are trying to work, the Gear district of Mongolia, where there are around 220,000 chimneys uh, or households burning coal to cook and to stay warm during the winter. And the air pollution issue is not just a problem in UB, but also in the countryside. 
uh, meaning different provinces. Uh, if you could see, uh, take a look at the red line. That is the you know the standard level. But if you could see the all the province centers, province centers which is located and built and planned like UB by the way. So uh, the it's just a mini and smaller versions of Adlambat in our capital city. And the air pollution impact is quite clear. Uh, we could say, um, I'm sure you have seen videos either by UNICEF or WHO regarding the low IQ preterm birth, but the recent, uh, the Mongolia specific study found out that children living in UB or the Ulaanbaatar has 40% less lung capacity compared to the children living in the countryside. So what it tells us is that children in UB are basically breathing with one lung. So that's what we are trying to uh, work with. And as any problem would, uh, you know, uh, present you, I think uh, I'm, I'm butchering this phrase and I'm, my apologies, I haven't slept last night. <laughs> so um, one, one of the uh, leading air pollution uh, experts uh, visited Mongolia and he said that uh, during his meetings with the private sector, why don't you guys invest in this? This is the biggest problem in Mongolia. So make this your next business move. So uh, guys, this is our market. And uh, this is where we have started in the winter of 2017 to 2018. So here's a very short story. Um, in the winter of 2017 to 2018 and the subsequent winters, we have gathered in both international and local experts on insulation and material scientists. Uh, they were from Google Home, the North Face, uh, the, the Arcterixes of the world. Um, and uh, we have gathered them in Mongolia and asked kindly, uh, asked them to visit our black market because we cannot, the gear community cannot afford the latest, the state of the art insulation materials for their insulation of their homes. Um, and meet our households and also a brainstorm and come up with the different designs for Mongolian gear so that it has the maximum insulation capacity, but at the same time providing uh, most eco and energy efficient electric heating possible. So this is what we came up with after uh, testing for two winters. Uh, and we called it the cooking, heating, and insulation package. It has uh, wall insulation type, door, roof, and a little ventilation on top, as well as through uh, by the door. And we have this um, electric heater as well. So far, after piloting in 2019, um, there are around over 2,000 households adopted or using this chip uh, in six provinces and two districts. And wherever we are operating this project or implementing this initiative, we are seeing a very striking or a positive changes, especially in the energy sector. For example, if you could take a look at Gobi Altai, green one, um, because of the surge in, sudden surge in uh, electric usage by the households uh, living in Gare, Gobi Altai province had to increase its investment in energy sector by three times last year, so that they could um, help support more people adapting into a cheap package. Therefore, also uh, reducing their air pollution as well. And this is not just for households. Uh, there are some kindergartens, and these are especially implemented by our partners in uh, UNICEF. And this project or this initiative is uh, complemented by other uh, mm -hmm. uh, initiatives that are being implemented in Mongolia. Uh, first one, this one is called Hezgezer. Uh, this is a community-driven air quality monitoring uh, platform where we are trying to see how 
uh, air quality is being impacted at the household level, be it uh, the children's absenteeism from school or your expense on uh, medicine and pills. And also, I mean, in Mongolia, if you go to the gear community, there are, um, I would say, at least 10 or dozens of INGOs or NGOs or local communities working and tinkering with little, uh, small solutions here and there. But uh, the knowledge sharing or the knowledge exchange has been lost a little. So uh, we have tried to bridge that gap by creating this um, knowledge platform called Agarnik, which is an open collaborative platform for air pollution initiatives. So all the projects, organizations, news and stories, uh, and the latest evidences are housed here. So, uh, so far, what has worked? Uh, we had good uh, district and local or provincial government commitment and funders and international partners and um, our partners at the Mongolian Sustainable Financing Association helped us to come up with a green loan which is supported by the National Committee or for reducing environmental pollution from banks and for those households who cannot qualify for bank green loans uh, the non-banking financing uh, institutes, they are also uh, creating their uh, own green loans. Benefits are, I think, quite obvious at this point. Indoor air quality improvement, health, tidiness, free time, safety, less air pollution, energy efficient, and cost keeping. Uh, I would just like to zero in on the cost keeping part, uh, cost uh, saving part here. When compared to burning coal for heating and cooking, actually when adapted to this package, the average monthly cost savings per family was around approximately around 56,000 Tugrik on a monthly basis. And that is roughly around, okay, this is like 20, May. yeah, a little less than $20. Okay, so these are, um, how the local and UNICEF and households and other donors are contributing to the project. And this is not just for the households. Uh, through this uh, package, we are also uh, creating new green jobs uh, through our chip producers. And um, I'm sure this presentation will be shared with you soon. So um, uh, there are some community engagements uh, very exciting initiatives that are going on. And going forward, we would like to explore more opportunities around innovative financing, especially on uh, carbon uh, market, and obviously try to diversify our uh, chip product, not just for kindergartens, not just for gear, community households, but also for businesses, tour operators, etc. And next, uh, we would like to possibly uh, with your collaboration also uh, help tackle the supply chain issue, therefore decrease the cost of the chip and um, further promote the scaling up. And thank you uh, for more information. I'm sure we'll be connected soon. Thank you so much, Grace. Okay. Last uh, quiz for the session. And later we're going to have around 10 minutes of a little panel discussion if you have some pressing questions for us. But let's um, fill up the questions and later see the rankings. So how many chimneys are there in the UB Gare areas? How many? 60, 110, 220, or 500,000? Looks like 17 chose the right answer. <laughs> Good. Next question is about
how many people have benefited from the CHIP program? Read carefully, we have different types, women, children, total, and then none of the above. So which one is the right number? More than 6,000 people. Okay, last question. What are some of the benefits of this program? Increased cost of savings for heating, improved pulmonary and respiratory health, increased free time for leisure activities, or all of the above? That was easy too, huh? Okay, so I invite please the speakers to come to the table. We're going to have a very quick Q&A session, about 10 minutes before we break for coffee. So guys, please come to the front. I think we are missing one speaker, but I think we can make do with four of us. So please. Um, Yeah, it's all right. We don't have a little discussion here, but I will let you guys to break it with the first question. Please go ahead, go to the microphone, sir, and ask your question. Hello, good morning. Uh, I'm Irshad. I work with GIZ in Pakistan. So great presentations, also particularly the, the hydrogen market and, and the Mongolian initiative. So my question goes to uh, just maybe what technical efficient okay, issues or challenges will you face while, you know, building pipeline for green hydrogen or overall, okay, it can be green, but generally as uh, uh, we hear, you know, from the literature that storing hydrogen and also putting into the pipeline, but additionally, you know, to, to bring it to the individual consumers. I don't know, maybe in the future, if it's also we have to fuel our cars. So how, how complicated, how difficult uh, on the technical standpoint? Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. So I think there uh, are a number of difficulties in shipping hydrogen by pipeline compared to methane. Uh, although it is an established technology, there are tens of kilometers of pipelines in the States and China, but primarily they're used just now to ship between refineries in the Gulf, for instance, in the States or, or as part of the state, uh, space program. So the key issues are that the quality of steel needs to be higher, which obviously leads to higher expense. The quality of weld needs to be higher because hydrogen is a very small molecule and it's looking to escape. Uh, compressors are not as energy efficient as they are for methane. So those issues all exist, but it is an established technology, whereas shipping hydrogen uh, as ammonia or as a liquid um, is, is far more challenging. Uh, I, I see no chance of hydrogen getting delivered to households. It just makes no sense to me to use it as a household fuel. Um, I, I think so that therefore it's transmission pipelines from large producers to large users such as steel and cement plants, that, uh, that it will have its primary application. Thank you. Any more questions, please? Yes, go ahead. Hello, my name is Ronald Ross from Donier Power and Heat. Uh, my question goes in the same direction regarding the, let's say, yeah, pipeline uh, transport. Is this pipeline which you envisage for your project, will it be part of your project or will it be considered as, let's say, public infrastructure to be yeah, built and invested by, let's say, some uh, supernatural uh, entity? Uh, typically, 
Methane pipelines around the world are, tend to be private sector finance, but, but often with significant political uh, issues involved, particularly when they cross borders. Uh, pipelines aren't cheap. So even uh, from Southern Mongolia to, to China, that's a half billion dollars right there. Um, so that's going to tend to be financed by large energy companies uh, of the size of Sinopec, for instance, who I mentioned earlier, are building a pipeline inside China and, uh, and actually project finance as well. I think you, maybe your question also goes to open access. That's a perennial issue for methane pipelines. Uh, typically the people who underwrite uh, the commencement of pipelines don't want others to free ride on them. So, so they tend to be fully contracted. Um, I think it's many decades away before we'll see issues of, of open access being, being, uh, being debated. We, we need to get uh, projects underway first and then in effect paid off before open access comes to, comes to the fore. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Um, I understand we have a lot of questions uh, for green hydrogen. And I would like you guys to ask questions about other things, like batteries, like smart grids, like support to guard communities. So those questions are welcome. Otherwise, Neil will monopolize the session. That's not the point. He will go to coffee break, and you guys can speak to him there. Thank you. Please. The lady in the front, please. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, I am Laura Kudebergenova from USA Central Asia, but my question is to our Mongolian colleagues, as I am from Kazakhstan, and um, our part of our population also lives in, uh, I understand your word is care, our word is yurt. Uh, so uh, I have been fascinated by the design of this uh, chip yurt, and uh, I understand that this project is supported by um, the government, by in, uh, IFIs, so it's not a commercial project, but still a question is, uh, maybe you consider in the future, I don't know, exporting this product or somehow distributing it to the region of Central Asia, including Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, where part of population also live in similar, um, um, in, in Yurt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, yes, that is correct. Uh, this is a development project implemented by IFIs and uh, INGOs and UNICEF, UN agencies. But uh, we are and we have supported in creating new jobs and new companies, which are the chip manufacturers. There are 20 of them in Mongolia, and some of them do export. And in the next phase of our project in scaling up, this is exactly what we are trying to do, uh, bring in big uh, supply um, electric heating or insulation material companies into Mongolia, help the cooperation agreement with the local producers and help promote it, therefore decrease the cost and help promote scaling up. And you are correct. Um, this is also a Khanat in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan or Yurt in Kazakhstan, here in Mongolia essentially are the same thing. And yeah, um, this is a uh, innovative uh, small project at the moment, but uh, we're hoping to scale up soon. Thank you. Just, okay, yes, please. Yeah, uh, question, Alfredo. Uh, on when we were implementing NAPC one, uh, there were multiple regional conferences that were held to discuss about the, uh, the benefits of uh, interconnection. And of course, I understand that COVID and everything, uh, things have slowed down, but are you going to resume such dialogues and when under the NAPC2? Um, yes, uh, the idea is to keep moving forward with uh, institutional collaboration and the, that, those conversations essentially Neil mentioned that this is going to be a government-to-government -government, uh, collaboration. It's not happening through private sector only. So ADB, uh, together with uh, UNESCAP, together with uh, EBRD, World Bank, we all be um, trying to break those uh, conversations, getting people together to start moving forward with, uh, with the structure of that secretariat, as well as the preliminary studies and, and where the investments would go. So we are starting with the second TA, 
and uh, this TA is going to start harboring all those workshops and conferences. Um, we only have two minutes left. I think we should have a question on battery source, smart grids before we break. Any taker? No interest from your countries? You don't want batteries to balance your grid? No? Okay, let's talk about girls then. No, uh, uh, again, actually, my second, uh, not a question, but a comment is for me as the USA Central Asia representative. Mm, and it's for the NAPSI project. Uh, USAID has been supporting the uh, secretariat for the uh, for a similar project that is called CASA 1000, Central Asia South Asia Interconnection Line. So the project uh, is being built by the by four countries uh, with support of IFIs and donors. But USAID has uh, not been supporting the infrastructure. It has been supporting the Secretariat, and recently it came to an abrupt stop. Stop because um, the U.S. government uh, could not support the project further because of the involvement of Afghanistan as one of the four countries, and um, it's been a uh, quite a shock for the other three countries. My po uh, my comment is, uh, please, um, if you are interested, approach me. I will share some experiences, and pre please approach our implementers uh, who implemented the secretariat because they have a wealth of knowledge of the barriers and difficulties and uh, ways to overcome those barriers and difficulties in connecting four very, very different countries, starting from technical issues and through uh, banking arrangements of money transfer and political resolutions and uh, organizational issues for um, regular meetings of the working group. So we have a wealth of knowledge. We have come a long way. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you, you're very right. Um, one of the main barriers for developing these integrated systems are essentially politics, geopolitics in some cases. Uh, for NAPSI, the participation of uh, Russia essentially blocks some of the participants on that table and that conversation. So that's something that we have to find a way of working around it. Um, but hopefully we manage to do that for the sake of having an integrated grid that is going to provide plenty of benefits for everybody. Okay, um, already over the time for the coffee break, I'm sure you guys want to have something to eat and drink. So we are going to be Okay, so we're not going to give prices now because I don't want you guys to run away and you come later. We're going to give all the prices for both sessions just before lunch. Um, so you have to come back if you want to collect your, your goodie bag. Uh, we're going to have a very interesting session after six presentations from ADB uh, experience together with private sector and public sector in China. More questions. Uh, the ranks are going to be separate. So the winners of the, this session are going to have their goodie bags and the winners of the second session are going to have another set of bags. It's not a combined ranking. So don't worry. You can have actually two bags and later give to somebody. All right, so thanks a lot for your participation and I'll see you in half an hour. Thank you very much. Before you leave, take a screenshot of the ranking. Sorry, take a screenshot of the mentee ranking so we can see the winners.
Yeah, okay. Let's resume uh, this morning session. Okay, uh, just now uh, the Mongolian session actually focused on this uh, battery storage, uh, this uh, regional uh, power interconnection, and also heating, uh, green hydrogen as well. Here, uh, we will start the session to share the ADB's projects in PRC, which is more on the multi-sector approach to address comprehensive like uh, issues such as uh, air quality improvement and uh, low carbon development. Uh, so here we show um, the uh, projects to be presented and the presenters. You can see six uh, projects will be shared here. Among those three, actually, uh, actually four from this uh, Greater Beijing Tianjin Hebei Air Quality Improvement Program. Uh, among those, actually, there are two financial intermediation loan, one uh, result based lending loan. Uh, in addition to that, there will be also two loans to be approved uh, in this year and next year, and also one loan. Uh, has been approved uh, last year. So now let's start today uh, for the PRC sessions and uh, knowledge sharing. The first speaker is uh, Ms. Ma Dingling. Um, she is the Director of Regional Planning Department of Ningbo Development Planning Research Institute. Uh, she holds a doctor degree from of the History of Science from Shanghai uh, Jiao Tong University. Um, as a director of the regional planning uh, research department, her main focus is on urban development strategy and policy recommendations, climate change mitigation, environment protection, and uh, resource conservation. Uh, Ms. Ma, please. Uh, I'm Ma Dingling, uh, delegated to participate in the forum. In the forum today, I would introduce Nimbor's practice on carbon reduction in refrigeration field. Uh, first, I will introduce some basic situation of Nimbor. As you know, global efforts to address climate change have promoted the carbon reduction action. At present, the cooling sector is particularly concerned with refrigerant replacement and the equipment's energy efficiency improvement. China has committed to reach carbon peak by 2060 and become carbon neutral by 2060 as the largest producer, consumer, and the trader of refrigeration, oh, no. Refriger refrigeration products is urging to, for China to take more pre-action actions to fully unleash the immense potential for energy savings and emission reductions. Ningbo is located in the southern parts of Changjiang River Delta with significant location and a unique port resource. In 2022, 20, uh, its GDP reached 
1.57 trillion yuan, ranking 12th nationwide, with the industrial added value of 668 billion yuan, ranking 7 nationwide. Meanwhile, Nimbus energy structure exhibits a high carbon feature and industrial electricity consumption accounts uh, for over 17% of the total social electricity consumption. As the numerous manufacturing industry and the living supplies continue to grow, the demand for refrigeration will increase significantly. Uh, we have identified the key areas for carbon reduc reduction in Nimbus public building, uh, public institutions, cold chain logistics, industrial refrigeration, and the chemical parts, in which the public institutions show a strong willingness to carbon reduction, while the commercial center and the cold chain logistics enterprise hold relatively low motives. Industrial refrigeration holds in most energy saving potential and economic benefits. However, it requires not only technology in motion, but also viable business models. Uh, we have found there are issues regarding funding, retrofitting, motivation, and the profitable model besides technology. First, the high on front investment. The buyers tend to focus on the cost of the equipment uh, itself rather than the potential energy cost savings, which makes users only replace their equipment when absolutely necessary. Second, high financing costs, financial in institutions have limited financing options available where the traditional loans require collateral, making it difficult for buyers to obtain loans, especially the SME buyers. So the length of activation financial institutions tend to favor short-term return when the owners and the users are not the same party. Neither party has the incentive to improve equipment efficiency. Equipment users lack the ability to fully employ uh, in energy saving potential. Equipment manufacturers and energy survive Service companies are only engaged in one-time equipment sales. Fourth, length of project aggregation green refrigeration projects are, uh, are failed to achieve economics of scale, make it difficult to attract investors. Uh, fifth, lack of efficient communication, information and resource circulation between market participants are not smooth. Uh, to solve these problems, first device solution needed, advancing the replacement of outstanding air conditioning systems on a large scale, optimizing central air conditioning systems in industrial enterprises, upgrade refrigerator in cold storage facility of cold chain logistics companies utilizing waste heat for refrigeration in chemical parts and fully utilizing LNG cooling energy in large scale data centers. Second, the government should play a guiding role in regulation and control, establishing mechanisms for energy saving inspections and energy consumption uh, quarters establishing energy saving credit system and promoting the construction of a digital energy monitoring platforms. Third, accelerate the research and application of energy saving technologies.
uh, first build device fantasy, fantasy challenges channels uh, adopt adopt sovereign laws and the super energy management contract model for project buildings. Explore uh, mechanisms for lowering the entry threshold and risks for energy service companies. Uh, the general approach of our work is driven by innovation, being green, digitization, and decarbonization with both economic and environmental benefits considered. Target key refrigeration areas explore the fantasy class fiscal model, uh, cultivate third party survive, survive organizations, and enhance international cooperation. Uh, eventually, make Ningbo achieve low carbon development. The main objective is the implementation of the first bench of projects is expected to save 119,000 tons of standard coal per year and reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 682,000 tons per year with the suffering loss of the ADB in innovating financing and uh, operation models. Through government guest, uh, guidance, innovation investment and operation models, cultivating a bank of energy saving service companies, clean energy development enterprises and third party uh, uh, intermediary engaged in fantasy and leasing business especially the low carbon development of a small and micro enterprises. Enhancing government energy saving man management capability and improve related functions, formulating oh, and implementing uh, post policies, policies related to the development of the energy saving industry, establishing a uh, statistical accounting and uh, evaluation system for green and low carbon uh, initiatives and employs the establishment of a market trading uh, mechanism. Uh, to achieve this, we propose to establish an organizational structure uh, to promote related work. First, establish an organizational system. Second, strength technical support. Third, promote the cap capacity building of local financial institutions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Ma. Uh, this project is a financial intermediation loan. It's being processed to be approved in early next year. The team leader from ADB is uh, Ms. Yun. So uh, during the Q&A session, if any questions address uh, relate to this uh, project, also you can uh, address to Ms. Yun. Um, next speaker. Uh, is uh, Mr. Shu Tan. Uh, he will present this affordable and uh, clean rural clean heating in, uh, in PRC. Mr. Shu Tan is the deputy team leader and economist of the uh, TA for uh, preparing sustainable projects in the PRC. Uh, he has more than 10 years experience in project processing and the implementation of ADB projects on the uh, transport, energy, and rural development. Uh, prior, prior to working as a consultant for ADB, he worked as a project officer in the sub-national government agency in PRC and uh, deputy department manager in the international consulting firm. He holds master of economy in uh, ecological economics from Peking University. Oh, sorry. We have the Menti, Menti question first for the previous one. Yeah, please.
Yeah, Shutan, please. Uh, thanks for everyone. Hope everyone still remember my name just uh, after a long break of the Miss Zhangli's introduction. Okay. Uh, my name is Shutan. It is a, a great pleasure to speak today on behalf of our entire TRTA team to, to introduce the Sanxi. Uh, the studies and experiences from our Sanxi Low Carbon and Inclusive Rural Development Project. As we know, the rural areas uh, are often left behind for clean heating with access to the clean energy. So this is why it is crucial for us to work together to find a solution to address the affordable and sustainable heating solutions for the rural communities. So I would like to share with you some experiences uh, worked, uh, we learned from our latest approved Sanxi project. Uh, I uh, assume some of you may not know where is Sanxi. So I just uh, make a map in front of my presentation. So Sanxi is a hinterland province of China. So our project, in fact, involves uh, several sub-projects. One is in Hechi County, one is in Xiangyuan County, one is in Jixian County, and another is in Houma County. So we have different kinds of sub-projects and components, which comprise of different activities and also facilities. To the we have we we call a low carbon a joint comprehensive joint low carbon intervention to promote the low carbon transformation of the province. So this is the project overview of our entire project. So uh, why I show this is because our clean heating is in within our project. So we have some uh, in, impact outcome and outputs. We have the project investment component and also the financial intermediary loans. So our, uh, what we are talking about is the Hechi County. Our project scope is in the Xunzhen, uh, uh, this town within the Hechi County. So here we can see the location of our project. So this is our pilot area. So our project covers 1,600 households in this Xunzhen town, and it is distributed in the 14 uh, villages. Okay. So when we, when we discuss the clean heating solutions, we should first look at the current existing conditions of the rural buildings in Hechi. We can see uh, as also similar to other provinces, other areas in China, and also in other places in Asia. The, these are some typical rural house in Hechi County. Like we have very big room, very big room, very big building areas, or maybe one single room, uh, 100 square meters. And also the insulation inside and outside is very poor with some very simple insulation facilities like this uh, wooden bamboo or some grass insulation. And also the people, the rural residents in China, especially in the rural area, they pay more attention to the appearance of the building than the energy efficiency. So this is the current challenges of our rural uh, heating in China. We, we can see also on the right, hand, right side of the presentation slides, these are the typical houses 
uh, uh, U-shape with a courtyard. So I'm, I think that uh, if we have friends in China, so people should be very familiar with the layout of these rural houses. So this kind of layouts pose significant challenges for the heating. Okay, so we can see the current heating conditions for the uh, Hechi County and also the typical China is very uh, poor. We can say traditional, use the coal-fired furnace and also they cause serious environment pollution inside and outside. And also we have to operate all the facilities manually and also pay oppose some uh, safety risks. And also the fire, this use the coal fire, uh, cause this chimney and use the coal, raw coal which will be difficult to control and the people will not feeling very comfortable within the house. So see, in facing these kind of challenges, the government work with ADB. Firstly, they propose an uh, original proposal to replace the coal-fired furnace in, with the clean heating solutions. This is their original proposal. They just modify the heat source and they use a complicated set of uh, air to water heat pump to replace the original, very traditional small coal fired furnace. This is quite a complicated one. Uh, so, if you have interest, we can further discuss after the presentation the work, how it does it work. But this kind of complicated uh, air to water heat pump has some challenges or problems. So, firstly, it is very expensive. It costs around 41,000 yuan per household for just now what we have presented this set. And also because it's complicated, so it's easy to broken or easy to failure. Uh, and also it's a high power so that we need to increase the power, the grid capacity uh, to fit and also to make that work. And also uh, this kind of heat pump is difficult to use in the low extreme, low winter, uh, low, low temperature during the winter time. So uh, this is uh, some challenges for this uh, the original proposal proposed by the government. Then this is the innovation, technical innovation from ADB's technical team. So that's our technical team and also with the support of the ADB project team, especially Mr. Zhang Lei. So we have set up some principles for uh, our clean heating. The improved insulation, easy to use, tailored heating, uh, and also uh, clean and green. And also we should, the most important because we are affordable heating. So we should have low cost in procurement and operation. And the one important thing is that it, it, we should have, the farmers need, have, uh, need to have easy access to fuel. So we're considering these sev several principles. We, we have some uh, solutions. First important is the building retrofitting and insulation. Just now, I think our Mongolia uh, friends also mentioned some uh, insulation uh, measure solutions in their Mongolia project. So in China, we also have the similar one. We have the EVA insulation curtain, the thermal wallpaper, and also the roof uh, insulation, and this kind of uh, internal insulation, and external insulation, we can increase the 5% uh, temperature increase and achieve 30% to 50% energy saving with very low cost. This kind of uh, retrofitting only costs, we can say, USD around USD 15 USD per square meter. So it's not expensive. And the most important thing is that uh, we have proposed a combination of heating source and heating solutions after we did a survey and piloting in several uh, households and, and in the villages. So we, we propose a combination, which means that 800 households will use the intelligent biomass pallet heating furnace. 350 households will adopt the L, L source L to L heat pump and 450 uh, uh, household, they will use the air source air to water heat pump and the, the, all of the 1,600 households, they will use, they will adopt the thermal insulation retrofitting and the to uh, provide the fuel for the biomass, we also propose to build a biomass pellet plant with an annual output of 2,000 to 3,000 tons. So with the combination of these uh, measures, we can achieve the reduction of the cost from uh, 41,000 to 21,000. Okay, uh, so this is the first, uh, uh, first kind of the L2 water heat pump. So it is com uh, complicated, but this kind of solution is suitable for those big houses, rich families, and with big uh, 
this uh, with better uh, family situations. So it can connect to the existing uh, pipelines in the, in the rural households. And this is the second kind of L to L heat pump. It's similar like air condition, but it has some uh, advantages. It can start in the extreme low weather, uh, minus 40 degrees Celsius, and it has two outlets for the kind of for the warm uh, uh, this kind of warm uh, uh, air flow. And also we can see we could, this can be also used in our Mongolia friends' home the yachts. This is uh, the second uh, uh, proposal. And the, the third one is the most innovative one is where that we replaced the original coal-fired furnace with this uh, biomass furnace. So it's intelligent, one-click operation, automatic feeding, intelligent, and also can achieve remote control. So this is can just connect to the existing water pipelines within the rural uh, households. And then we can see we will replace the original coal to this traditional one heating to the intelligent biomass, this kind of furnace, it can automatically feed in and automatically control the temperatures. And also to provide the fuel of the biomass. So we will also de develop a new business model and we have a cooperative to processing the uh, uh, biomass pellets. So we, the people, the farmers, they can use, they can took, take three tons of straw and they can replace one tons of this fuel or they can pay some uh, processing fees. So it can also increase the income of local people and also reduce the emission and also reduce the cost. The most important thing is affordable. So after this combination of the, our uh, uh, solutions, we can achieve the uh, cost reduction quite significantly. So we can discuss this uh, with you if you are interested. And also apart from the cost, we can also reduce the uh, emission, uh, carbon emission. So quite sig significantly, we could, uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I hate this clock, but I would like to share with you more. So uh, one more thing, the most important thing is that we should achieve the sustainability of our entire solution, entire proposal, so that uh, apart from the hardware facilities, we also propose, uh, propose to develop a set of the evaluation and technical guidance on clean heating so that we can use this energy and promote the use of renewable energy and the clean, uh, promote the clean rural and urban integration and finally achieve our sustainable development goals. So this is our uh, lessons learned from our latest science project. So if you are more interested, I hope uh, uh, we can discuss later. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Shutan. Now it's uh, the Manti quiz time. Question. Which clean heating solution is not it's not proposed for this project? Natural gas boiler, biomass pellet heating furnace, air source air to air heat pump or air to water heat pump. Very good. Which activity is not included by this project? Promoting energy efficiency improvements, both heating device and the housing, housing what? Decarbonizing the power generation sector. Develop, yeah, very good.
Uh, which clean heating solution has been selected by most households? I think the presentation shows, but uh, Shutan didn't uh, talk about it. Yeah. If you uh, read the slides. Very good. Okay, so I mean, uh, Shutan has made a very clean presentation. Um, well, Um, let's continue. Uh, the next speaker is Miss Duan Xiu Mei. She's a uh, uh, show this. Oh, okay, this is a CSAP. Uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, Miss Liu Hong Yan. Uh, Ms. Liu is a chairwoman and a general manager of CSAP Fund, a fund management company dedicated to investing in green development projects in China. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience in private equity investment, focusing on energy efficiency, environment protection, and clean energy. She also served as a lecturer at Peking University, uh, teaching banking and finance. She obtained her master degree in uh, economics from Peking University and uh, George Washington University. Yeah, Miss Liu, please. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to share our stories. We made our efforts in decarbonization through fund investments. The di diagram here shows the features of our fund. The top is the facility, which is funded by ADB loan amounted to uh, 428 million euro. Under the facility, there are three types of funds working, which mobilize investment from different entities uh, such as local governments, industry enterprises, and institutional investors. The facility and the funds make investment into qualified sub-projects, which are uh, comply with ADB's ESMS standards and also should meet our funds investments criteria. The mission of this whole fund mechanism is to uh, committed to deploy high-level techno high technologies to support air quality improvement in China, uh, the greater BTH region in particular. I started from early 2019, four funds has been established, uh, invested in 19 projects. In those areas, uh, we focused on like residual heat utilization, integrated waste treatment and utilization, and et cetera. Uh, all those investments generated impressive environmental benefits, like in the uh, energy saving, in the uh, clean heating, also re reduce uh, pollutions. Uh, some examples of our of the projects we supported. This one integrated waste treatment and utilization. And this one used sewage heat pump for heating and uh, cooling. And this uh, used several high technologies in energy saving, emission reduction, utilization of waste heat and hydrogen in a chemical industry park. 
uh, now uh, the new and the exciting one we are working on this year, the CCUS project. As you know, CCUS means uh, carbon dioxide capture, transportation use and storage. This diagram shows the, the whole value chain of the CCUS. Mm, before we go to the detail of our project, let's take a quick look at the industry. Uh, this shows the, the major players in the world in, and the number of projects, uh, the capacity of CCUS. You can see uh, the year 2022 is a strong year for CCUS. The growth in both number of projects and capture capacity uh, signals the increasing confidence in the industry worldwide. China's CCUS project started in 2003, mostly a small scale projects. Uh, the year 2022 is also a milestone year for China's CCUS industry. China uh, launched its first integrated milling town uh, projects and it's get, it started operation in 2022 and more breakthroughs are coming up in this year and later. Uh, the policy, the, the background of the CCUS in industry in China, the policies, uh, China pledged to uh, carbon peaking by 2030 and to reach carbon neutrality before 2060s. And uh, with this, with this uh, ambition, uh, a, set of a set of policies are introduced uh, for the financial part, like the central bank in 2021 launched a carbon emission reduction facility, which provide structural monetary policy with low cost loans to support decarbonization projects. Yeah, this table shows the CCUS reduction demand potential by industries in China. You can see the steel industry is facing rising pressure to reduce carbon footprint and CCUS will play a critical role. And now is, uh, let's go to the project we're working on. It's a project covering the whole CCUS value chain. Uh, that means including capture, transportation, storage, and utilization. It's located in Northern China built by one of China's major steel makers. It's going to start operation by end 2025. It's a big project. The first phase of the project captures uh, 0.5 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. Mm, the technolo technology is adopted. Uh, sorry, I'm not, I'm not a techno technology person. I'll try my best to explain this. Uh, the, for the capture part, this project captures uh, carbon dioxide from flue gas, which, is, which are generated from the steel production process and use a chemical absorption system and uh, uh, alcohol imide are used as the absorbent. Um, captured carbon dioxide are put into effective uh, use. This project explores, explores some new roles of carbon dioxide utilization. One is uh, carbon di dioxide mineralization. It uses carbon dioxide and steel slag for chemical re reactions to generate some new compounds. And those compounds are used in plastics, paper, paint, rubber, and steel making process. As we know, how to deal with steel slag and carbon dioxide has been a difficulty for the steel industry. And in this project, 
the waste generated from steel production are uh, recycled and used as inputs into the steel making process. So it's a it's a good start, a good good example for uh, recycle. Uh, another new role of carbon dioxide utilization is uh, used as fertilizer in agriculture. Carbon dioxide used as fertilizer could enhance photosynthesis. It has been proved highly efficient in greenhouse agriculture. When carbon dioxide concentration increased, the production the output of fruits and vegetables are increased and disease incidence rate reduced. Also the organic nutrients are increased, the quality and taste of those fruits, fruits, uh, fruits and vegetables uh, are improved. Uh, the project has been actively cooperating with local agriculture department to develop an uh, ecological agriculture base. This picture is one of the base, it's a greenhouse. Mm, besides uh, carbon dioxide mineralization and the fertilization, the project is also cooperating with universities to develop methods producing chemicals such as uh, methanol, synthetic, synthetic, synthetic gas, and sodium carbon carbonate. Uh, besides the, the new technologies it adopted, as fund manager, we analyze our projects uh, from, in terms of financial uh, terms. The, the project, the total investment cost of this project is uh, RMB yuan 630 million. The fund financing will be 200 million and the remaining will be provided by commercial banks in loans. The operating revenue of this project is expected to be more than uh, two, 200 million per year and operating cost is 234 million per year. So it's uh, financially viable and uh, sustainable. And uh, the future of the project is uh, promising. Ah. And also, we have a short video showcasing the, the carbon dioxide uh, fertilization. So let's enjoy the video, please. Ah. Okay, 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 thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. The uh, CCUS, the key challenge is uh, commercialization, the financial viability. So here, uh, Ms. Liu shows they are under the IFI loan, they are doing the due diligence for one sub project uh, for the utilization on CO2 mineralization, uh, agriculture utilization, as well as the chemical utilization. Uh, when you send the uh, due diligence report to me, because I'm the project officer for this loan. So let's discuss and maybe agriculture fertilization may not really cause uh, CO2 reduction. We can discuss later. Yeah, okay. Um, Many questions, yeah.
Uh, what are the financial products provided by this project? Uh, equity and debt investments through the funds, guarantee and interest loans, guarantee and equity investment, only quite equity investment through the funds. Yeah. Right. What are the key features of this project? Inclusive finance for SMEs, focusing on single sector in one province, deploying high level technology in heavily polluting and high energy consumption sectors, policy reforms. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, the last question. What is the source of the CO2 to be captured by the proposed CCUS project? Uh, I think the, the answer are not right. Uh, so this is uh, it's not be considered. Uh, this is wrong. Um, the answer are not relevant. Sorry, I think. Okay, um, let's go to the next speaker, uh, Ms. Duan Xiu Mei. She's a Direct General of the Department of International Green Finance and Cooperation of China National Investment Guarantee Corporation. She has over 20 years experience in green finance and has involved in the design and the implementation of uh, uh, several projects founded by Beijing Municipal Bureau of Finance, World Bank, uh, Global Environment Fund, and ADB. Uh, the re implementation results of these projects have been uh, have received well recognition from the industry. Yeah, it's done. Thanks, Lee. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Duan Xiu Mei from RNG. It is indeed an honor to join this year's forum. And I would like to thank ADB for bringing us together uh, uh, and for providing continued support to assist in the PRC in addressing climate change during these years. Today, I want to share with you our green financing experience targeting SMEs and ho hope our experiences could shed something, some light on this issue. There are four, four part, main, tar, main, part, main, main parts of my presentation. First of all, uh, a brief introduction of RNG. RNG is founded in 1993 by the MOVE and the SETC. It is the first specialized guarantee institution in China with a long-term credit rating of 3A. Our core business, our core business is credit enhancement, fintech assessment and management. Sorry. ING has long been practicing the concept of green development and has cooperated with international organizations like World Bank and ADB. And we are currently executing the ADB funding green financing platform project, project, including phase one and phase two. As you can see from 
from the picture, ING by FIL use the sovereign loan from ADB by various meaning of financial instruments, mainly the, the credit enhancement and investment to establish an, uh, a green financing platform referred as a GFP, which is expected to be sustainable and to promote the finance to the air improvement pro sub projects in the great, greater BTH region. The GFP projects has a total amount of um, 585 million euros and a term of 15 years. Oh, sorry. Our vision to contribute to air quality improvement and green SMSEs in this in, in the PRC. Our target sector include clean energy, energy saving and emission energy reduction, green transportation and waste to energy. Thanks to the help of the ADB and Chinese government so far, the GFP project is pursuing well. And as shown in the slide, we have been thrilled and honored to have won this award and uh, from local and abroad. And for the third part, I want to share with you one of the key highlights of the GFP, customization. In other words, we can provide a tailored financial product to meet the diverse demands of clients, especially green SMEs. For example, the uh, the JP. Anything wrong with their slide? The GFP set up a guarantee loss reserve and introduced a guarantee and credit enhancement mechanism by providing, oh, by providing guarantee to green loans, bonds, and security. We are able to further reduce green absentee financing costs and catalyze co-financing. Our phase two project also put forward an innovative product, Clean Air Bond, um, which aligns with both domestic and international green bond standard. We can not only provide guarantee to CAB, but also make CAB investment to, su to support this insurance. The JFP project can also offer direct loans to Green MC or in a more efficient way to financing leasing company to, to encourage their leases to implement green and sub projects. Based on this mode, we can further expand that our supporting scope for green MCs. Oh, sorry. Another financial instrument we can adopt is equity investment, especially to early stage company with innovative low carbon uh, technologies and a high growth potential. The GFP aim to not only increase the green uh, and startups capital, but also their financing cap capacity. Uh, oh, must faster. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, no. Um, for green MSC money, money is not enough. There remains considerable need to fill their knowledge gap on green development. During these years, we also endeavor to strengthen green MSC capacity to access financing. So far, 60 training have been delivered uh, and delivered by NG on technology, environmental safeguard, and uh, financing assessment and post loan management with over 100, uh, 1,300 participants involved. Um, next, 
uh, I would like to show you some typical sub project on the TKEN. First, <laughs> a guarantee uh, sub project. We providing a guarantee for farmers to obtain uh, obtain loans for storing solar PV um, power generation stations on their rooftop. The long term to 15 years with average loan amount of 17,000 yuan for each household. The sub project also rely on FinTech to build an online operation platform where the whole transaction including loan application approval and the disbursement can be done online. This project is helpful to raise local farmers income and there has been avoided the typical cases of China inclusive financing last year. Uh, next. A green battery being guaranteed sub project. It's a very famous China uh, EV, EV company, new. And next, last year, this is a ABAA a clean air bond in Anji County. Um, this is a bar chart. The the following subject is an interest loan. I don't know the get fast. Sorry, some showcase hydrogen bars. The last <laughs> now is sharing. Okay, team building, which lays a solid foundation for the successful implementation of the project. The PMO should have a diversity academic background, and so as to screen, assess, and select the potential green MCC effectively. Secondly. Customization, we have talked through that before. Certainly, leverage effect. RNG has been actively participating with other stakeholders, including commercial banks, financing leasing company, regional guarantee corporation, to leverage more social capital to invest in green MCs and create multi power effect. Uh, lastly, capital uh, capacity building to support green MCs sustainable development. <sighs> we, we continue. <laughs> As we move forward, we will continue to strengthen our partnership with ADB to advance the progress on green MCs investment and uh, capacity building. We also look forward to a joint hand with other counterparts and to promote green financing for green MCEs and, and to mitigate climate change. That brings the to the end. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. John. You have the best um, time management within 10 minutes, exactly 10 minutes. Um, let's uh, start the uh, Manti quiz.
what are the financial products provided yeah, to meet the green SME's financial demand? Guarantee, direct loan, equity investment, fund, and trust the loan, equity investment. Okay. What is most important measure to promote battery as a service in PRC? Nine. The first clean air bond was issued for a sub project in uh, Anji. What type of uh, sub project that CAB supports? Okay. Thank you. Um, we have uh, only 20 minutes left. So uh, for the next two speakers, please restrain your uh, presentation within 10 minutes so that we have time for the uh, uh, prize award. Uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Mr. Liu Fenglin, the director of uh, UTN New Energy uh, Project Office. He owns a master uh, management from uh, Tsinghua University, master of science from University of uh, Adelaide, and master of engineering from U University of uh, Melbourne. He has 80 years of experience in Australia uh, electricity industry and over 10 years experience in China, uh, the natural gas industry. Yeah, Ms. Liu, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this section. Uh, my topic is building a diversity energy development of system with a green power biomass based on the crow to gas program in order to promote the royal energy revolution and supporting the royal revitalization. Okay, let's begin. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, four parts. The first one background. Second one is the information of the program implementation. And uh, we, I will mainly introduce the positive impact of the ADB loan. And the last but not least is the program innovation and extension. Next, please. Next slide. Next slide. The program background. Okay, we can see that the provincial government launched the cleaner fuel switch investment program, which aims to establish a country based uh, network of the gas to serve like 4.5 mil, million customers at, in about like 80 country in Henan province, which are not very developed. And uh, despite the rapid growth of the natural gas consumption in China, some people, and maybe most of the people in on development area in Henan province are still not covered by the gas pipeline. The major reason is the high cost of investment. So to ensure the suitable funding for the long-term investment needs of the general fuel switch program, we adopt the ADB's result-based line loan. Okay, next please. Next. The whole program, the implementation has three stage. Next slide. Uh, first one is the negotiation, the second one is the signing, and the last one is the verification and the payment. From the negotiation to signing, we only spent nine months to finish it, and there's a time recorder of this home loan at this moment in China. We wish some people can break it. And uh, verification and the payment, uh, from 2025 to now, we finished, uh, we completed three uh, verification and the withdrawal, totally 100.37 mil in Europe dollars. And uh, I think the result is very good. Next slide. 
okay, the Yu Tianyu Energy Company is running this program. This company has two major shareholders. One is the public partner, which is called Zhongyuan Yu Investment Group. It, uh, by 2022, the group was a uh, consolidated assets of uh, 400 billion owns a uh, domestic uh, rating triple A and international rating tri uh, Moody A2 and international rating A French. I think this at this moment is the only group with the three triple A level in Henan province. And uh, Tianlun Gas Property Company, which is a private company, is running basically in 17 provinces in China, which is a leader gas company in China at this moment. Next slide, please. Okay, we have an uh, executive agency and an implementing agency. The executive agency is the uh, Henan Province Department, uh, sorry, Henan Financial Department. And the implementing agency has a two level office. One is set up in the group of uh, user group and the other one is set up in Yutian Companies group. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the big advantage of this type of the loan is it simplifies the pre preparation of this application and it obviously increases the speed of the application. That's why we can run, we can finish this application in nine months. But the one of the disadvantage is that you have to discuss the, re the outputs and arms with the ADB at the beginning of this program. And during the implementation, maybe you have to adjust. And if you cannot finish the result, sorry, you cannot get the money. That's the meaning of the ADB, uh, sorry, the RBL. Next slide, please. This is the target of our program. We have eight outputs, and this moment we finish uh, some of the targets and give really good results. That's why we can withdraw 100 million European dollars, and we will try our best in the coming two or three years to achieve all of the targets and finish the uh, withdrawal. Next slide, please. Okay, impact of the ADB loan. Next slide. Okay, you can see from the picture. With the steady program of the coal to low program in villages, the supply structure of the Royal Energy has been efficiently optimized. From this picture, you can see before, women usually use the firewood and the coal to cook and the heating, which are really dirty and not very convenient. Sometimes it will catch, it will get the really damage for the women. They got some lungs issues during the winter time. And at this moment right now, they're using the natural gas. It's very clean and convenient. Also, it will help us to improve the air quality and reduce the air population, pollution, sorry. Next slide, please. And the second one is that it did, it indeed increased their living standards. So you can see this picture. The top one is now the kitchen. It's very modern, clean, and very bright. And before you cannot imagine, it's really dirty, it's all dark. And sometimes even you walk in the street, you can smell the smoke, especially during the winter time, because they use the wood and the crow to cook, to heat it, very dangerous. And now another benefit is in Henan, in, like in Henan one family in their, in their village, they're saving like a half price for their cooking energy. Before they already spent 100 Chinese dollars for one month. And right now they only spend $50 for clean, you know, natural gas energy. Next slide, please. And the last but not the least is at the, during this program, by the end of uh, April, 2003, we already run 1000 awareness, the public activities uh, with women to increase the awareness of how and why, and what can we do to use the newer, the clean energy, and which is very good. These all the standards are follow the AD, ADB's rule. Next step, please. Okay, during this program, we will build another project which is called a biogas factory. For this project, it will consume more than 200 tons of the corn straw annually. It's the estimated potential maximum carbon dioxide emission reduction of this program is 400 tons per year, which is really huge. And this program will be running at the end of this year. Next slide, please. Uh, besides, we talk about the impacts the, to the people and the society. This aid program will did help us to improve our management. For example, we ensure the quality of the program that match the national specification and the standards. We learn a lot from ADB. And then we follow ADB's requirement. We set up the ESG system, which is really good for our future. Okay, next class, please. Okay, last is the innovation and the extension. Okay, before we use the 
new forms of the new energy, such like uh, you know, the solar, the wind, even the biomass. We cannot get rid of the traditional energy chain, such as petrol, natural gas, even the corn, because they are the platform for people. They are the platform for the people to live in. That's why we have to say, making before breaking. But what can we do? What we can do is integrate all the advantages. We can use some of them to, we have to increase the efficiency and balance all the energy during the implementation. For example, we built solar on the top of a village's house. We supply the, the natural gas. That's we can supply electricity. We can give them the natural gas supply. That means all their energy using, we can all supply. You can see from the picture, once you build up all the facility, that's not the end. You have to give that the maintenance. If this all the facility lose the maintenance, you cannot survive a long time. We have to give the, you know, we set up all the office and help them to maintain it a long time. Okay. We have to facing lots of problems during the switch. What kind of the problem are least some? For example, harm of the return biomass to the land, like a pollution of a burning burk coal and the garbage pollution, even the high feeding cost. All these problems we have to face. Once we face this problem, that means we can smoothly switch from the you know, traditional energy to the new energy. Okay, next slide, please. That's why I draw this uh, map. It's like an econ system. For this, you can see this map. We have like a four parts, yellow, green, blue, and uh, brown. For example, the green one. You use the wind, you use the bio, you know, the solar to generate the cheaper electricity, you use the network to give to the biomass factory. They use the electricity to generate the gas. They use the resource is the waste. That means you save the power and transfer the power. You use the cheapest power to produce some convenient power. And then you use the gas pipeline to lead the natural gas to the village. People use the natural gas for their living. And then they can put the, you know, the solar on the top of their living, which is really convenient and help them to reduce the cost. And then you can, you can use the, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, the agriculture waste as a resource to produce the gas. I think this is the most important thing for us, even for the new energy guys. If you only focus on the new kind of the energy, sometimes you lose some of the chain. If you have to want to help the people to set up the whole system, maintain the whole environment, I think the ecosystem is very important. Thank you very much. That's my topic. Uh, thanks, Feng Lin. Yeah, let's uh, start this uh, uh, Manti quiz. Uh, by the way, uh, from this session, from the PRC session, we have changed the code. So uh, please register again for the for the for the quiz. Now we have only five participants. We have two questions for this pr presentation. <laughs> Which item is not the advantage of a result based landing modality? Right, this <laughs> leverage of the mask results that's for FI loan. Which indicator is the outcome level disbursement link indicator? It's for the RBL. Yeah. 
gas consumption. Sorry. Okay. Um, the last, not the least, um, the speaker is uh, yeah. The speaker is uh, Miss Yuan Yang. She is the head of the Energy Conservation and the Environmental Protection Department of Shanxi Financial Holding Department Investment Company. Um, this project uh, is also another FI loan uh, was closed last year uh, based on the current uh, PCR rating, which has not been finalized yet. Uh, it, uh, is, it was rated uh, highly successful. So uh, Ms. Yang, yeah. Good morning, everyone. It's a great honor for me to communicate with you all today in this ADB headquarters. My name is Chloe. Uh, I'm from the Department of Energy Conservation and Environmental Protection of SFHG Development and Investment Management Company. Uh, so, company and today my topic is innovative intermediate lending model based on the low carbon circular development. So my presentation gonna be divided into four parts. So first project background. So China is the world largest energy consumers, the comb Dominate economic structures had a severe had a severe um, impact on China's natural environment and has been the main causes of the country's high greenhouse gases emissions and the severe air and water pollution. In order to solve this problem, the Chinese government has made promoting environmental sustain sustainable development a priority. So in 2014, the traditional lending model of using funds from international financial org organization to support specific fields was mainly approved by development and reform departments of Chinese government. Unifying borrowing and repayment by financial department and uh, specify implementation by each operator. So although the traditional model achieved the purpose of using international low cost funds to support development of specific fields in China to a certain extent, there are also problems such as low level fund management and non-standard operation. The Provincial Department Development and Reform Commission and the Provincial Department of Finance agreed to entrust the operation and management of any new policy national sovereign credit loan project, Asian Development Bank loan, Shanxi Energy Efficiency Improvement and Environmental Promotion project to fin Shanxi Financial Holding Group and to build Financial Holding Group into a provincial market-oriented project execution agency and pr provincial green financial services platform for foreign loans. So these are the, some basic information of our loan. According to the project management menu, the ADB project fund loan is 150 million US dollars and the loan support condition needs to comply with relevant policy of ADB and guarantee mortgage recognized by the financial holding group. The main fields we support by the loan are energy conservation, emission reduction and air pollution control. Our loan term is three to eight years for each sub, sub project, which can be also extended to 10 years. So our project starts from 2017 and ended just last year, uh, 2022. And the, ex is the, execu the executive agency is, uh, is Shanxi Financial Holding Group and the implementation agency is the uh, 
Shenxi Financial Holding Group Investment and Management Company. So these are the fields that our loan can be uh, used for. So the main investment fields are industrial energy efficiency improvement project, air pollution control, and the new energy utilization. So there are some characteristic and added value of our ADB loan project. Um, we, our project adopt the four in one organization model of government plus platform plus financial institutions and third party services agency in innovatively and the combined financial model of sub loan plus guarantee plus lease to support development and uh, utilization of clean energy in Shanxi province through the um, introduction of investment plus talents, improve the te technical level of the traditional industrial and improve energy efficiency. And also our group, we established the highly market oriented operation uh, model and the use of the loan funds is more flexible. Okay. And also we promote the establishment of a new mechanism of green financial services platform for energy conservation and environmental protection. And we also set up a professional management and implementation, implementation team for the National Syringe Loan Project. So from the so from the floor chart, we can see uh, our project starts from two thousand sixteen and completed on two thousand twenty. The current situation of our uh, clean energy financing platform, um, the financial intermediary of this project is SFHG. During the implementation of our project, SFHG strictly abided by various laws and regula regulations, improved the governance mechanism, and ensure um, compliance operation. Also, our team members were regularly organized to go to Beijing, Shanghai, and other places to participate in the long training of international financial organization organized by the Minister of Finance and ADB. Also, due to the COVID-19, we organized several online publicity and the training sections with the long sub-project units. and achievements. So after the project completion, we established the CEFP financing platform for Shanxi energy conservation and emission reduction, sub-project financing and successfully implement nine energy conservation and emission reduction projects. And also ADB per, per our, ADB project leveraged 1.02 billion for clean energy investment in 2021 and according to preliminary estimate by third party energy conservation, our project will, will save 331,000 tons of standard coal and reduce carbon dioxide emission by 919,000 uh, tons by 2023. And the EDB loan project of SFHG has been an excellent 
domestic EDB loan project and has been selected as the project with best performance in energy category by ADB in 2021. So we value our projects from four aspects, uh, from relevance, relevance, efficiency and achievement and sustainability. And our project was really as highly successful by ADB this year. So there are some experiences we gained after implement the ADB project. Through the ADB project, SFB, SFHG gained a lot of experiences. We established a relatively complete decision-making management system for ADB loan project. Also, the system, systematic guidance and training for a sub-project unit to prevent complaints risk during the project implementation has been strengthened. And the ADB loan and the, uh, and the recovery principles were jointly reissued to the sub-borrowers, which not only ensure the efficient use of the ADB loan funds, but also meet the relevant audit, audit requirements. And there are some lessons we uh, gain. So I want to talk about the, ex the interest rate and the exchange rate a little bit. SFHG applied to the ADB to lock in the interest rate in 2020 and locked the 84.98 million withdrawn at that time at the interest rate of 1.823% according to the ADB policies since 2022 due to the delisting of LIBOR. The unlock part of 34.7 million has been changed to a floating interest rate based on the software index of affected by the Federal Reserve's um, in interest rate has been rising. The sharp rise in interest rate had a great impact on the pricing of the sub-project of the ADB project. So in order to effectively control the overall interest rate of ADB project, the SFG has put forward the interest rate locking plan for the unlocked 34.71 million on the basis of, of a comprehensive study of the ADB policy. So our plan is to comprehensively compare the recent train trend of the US dollar floating interest rate and swap interest rate. At present, the US dollar floating interest rate is higher than the swap interest rate. So our proposal is to lock the remaining 34.71 million directly to the expiration of the project to avoid the risk of scoring interest rate. Um, caused by the uncertainty of the Federal Reserve's interest hike when the market lower than the interest rate the sfhg will apply to the unlocking of the interest rate in accordance with the adb policy and also in order to avoid the foreign foreign exchange rate risk of the adb project sfhg have repeatedly con the banks and other financial institutions to consult and understand the reasonable solutions to avoid foreign exchange rates. So exchange rate locking will ensure that the ADB project is not affected by the ex exchange rate. However, locking the exchange rate also increases the financial cost of the ADB project the longer the term, the long term, the higher the foreign exchange premium and the higher the cost of our foreign exchange lock. So according to the plan, the ADB project will be repaid in equal terms from 2027. So SFG will consider the necessity and possibility of exchange rate locking from 2024. Thank you. Thanks. Um, now let's go to the quiz, the Manti quiz.
uh, this is a the project will cause annual GHG emission reduction roughly what amount? Um, right. So there are only two questions for this uh, presentation. What activities the FI has taken using ADB's flexible loan product? Uh, she mentioned in the last part. Okay, um, now time is, uh, I think we still can have a quick Q&A session. Uh, I invite the speakers please to sit in the front. Let's have a very short Q&A question, then uh, award the prize to the, uh, uh, for the two sessions. Yeah. Let's have a very quick, quick uh, Q&A session so, so that we can have lunch. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for the question, because just now the time was very limited, so I cannot explain too much about the, uh, the difference between these three options. In fact, uh, what we have proposed for these three options uh, depends on the own characteristic of the farmers. Uh, firstly, uh, we, uh, we, we discussed was the, is the rural clean heating. Is first, the first point is that rural clean heating is different from the urban heating, which we can use centralized or district heating. But for rural heating, we, we have chosen this tailored option. The main difference is de also depends on the demands and also uh, the current situation of the uh, farmers which needs the heating. For example, if people use uh, live in big house, they have very, uh, we can say rich, so they can choose this complicated, uh, this L2 water heat pump, or they can use, they have big farm, or they have enough, a lot of straw or, or this kind of things, they can, they can choose the biomass uh, furnace. So if people live in, they only in a very small house and very limited person, they only need uh, one small room for, to be heated. Uh, some people, maybe they are working outside and they just came home during night only for small room. For example, for us young people, uh, we work, we work outside and only come back home. At late night, we only need a small room heated. So they could, the best choice is the L to L heat, heat pump, so we, it, which is more, much more flexible. So they can also much more cheaper. So I think that the choice of these three options uh, also uh, still depends on the demands of the users. Thank you. Yeah, basically uh, household demand, uh, uh, consumer behavior and the local available resources. Yeah, next question. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, before they are thinking of uh, questions, yeah. so I may provide some additional information of uh, all the projects just pr uh, presented, the highlights of those uh, projects. Yeah. Uh, my name is Yun Zhou, I'm environment specialist. I've been uh, involved either in implementation or processing of all the projects they just presented. So I just want to give you some highlight, uh, highlights of each project. The first project, uh, who presented? Uh, uh, let's start from uh, Miss Liu, the uh, uh, CCUS project. That project is an FI loan focusing on deployment of uh, high technologies. It ha established a fund of fund structure. So this is the highlight. Apart from this uh, CCUS project, it's quite a large scale, uh, 500,000 tons uh, carbon will be captured from a, a steel uh, company. Uh, they have also uh, applied use the technologies to use the waste heat from waste uh, treatment, uh, the heat from waste treatment, uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, to provide uh, central heating in the winter time. So this is an area 
uh, that is quite, I knew uh, in Europe, uh, it has been used uh, quite for quite long time, but in China, this might be the first adoption of this kind of technology. And the second project is ING's uh, green financing platform uh, project. As Ms. Duan mentioned, this project focuses on MSE. The highlight of this project is to uh, uh, make tailored financial products to meet the market demand. So for example, we have uh, equity investment, entrusted loan, financial leasing, uh, clean air bond, uh, as uh, Ms. Duan mentioned, and also guarantee, we provide guarantee. And this is also an inclusive project. Ms. Duan gave an example of uh, uh, rooftop solar PV. So that is to provide guarantee to the farmers uh, to actually to install the uh, P, uh, solar PV panels on this rooftop. There's another project supported, sub-project supported by ING, which is to uh, like the company, uh, solar company rent rooftop. They give, based on the size of the rooftop, they give actually uh, several thousand yuan to the farmers uh, to install solar PV. So this is a two different kind of uh, 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 financial model, uh, the modality of the BTH project. And uh, for the Shanxi, but Fengling has uh, give a very uh, clear introduction of Henan RBL project. For Shanxi projects, there are two highlights. One is to uh, use geothermal, which is, uh, we call it non-interfering geothermal a deep well geothermal uh, projects to, uh, pro uh, for central heating in commercial uh, apartments. So instead of extract hot water from uh, 2000, uh, 2000 uh, to 2500 meters uh, deep, they ex only extract heat. So this uh, avoid the problem of uh, a groundwater depletion. Another highlight is, uh, we just visit one building, which is a passive building, a, a commercial apartment building. They use the highest green building standard, German standard, standard certification uh, in this uh, commercial building, uh, which will not require cooling or heating in winter time. So these are the two, uh, the two highlights of this project. Another project is Ningbo Cooling Project. We will be uh, targeting uh, district cooling using uh, industrial waste uh, among different industrial parks. And also we will uh, have, uh, like we, we will uh, involve in early retirement of old uh, cooling systems. Uh, that have uh, been installed 20 or 30 years ago. So this will be one of the highlights for, for Ningbo project in, t in the uh, cooling sector. But we will be targeting also other areas uh, with uh, innovative technologies that has never been used in China or in Ningbo city. So th this is just some uh, additional information for all of these projects. Thank you, for, hope this is interesting to you and helpful. Thank you, thank you Yun for this. Uh... From ADB Zango, what are the key innovative features of those projects? Um, question? Any from the floor? If no, uh, we can award the prize for the two session Mongolian uh, this uh, knowledge sharing and the PRC knowledge sharing. Can we show this uh, ranking the top three <laughs> for the two sessions? Six people total. You see me take a picture first? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can take a photo first.
called the Mongolian session, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Who is the person? I've here. Um, Bryce Time, is any of the first three in the room? Earthman? Number three, Vikas. Oh. So we don't have uh, the winner and the second. That's nice. Okay. So you can. <laughs> yeah, the thing is that we don't know who they are, so we could keep, but that's not the point. Anyway. So, well, maybe they come later and claim. So I'll give you this one. Thank you for, for joining and waiting until the very end. Yes, well, uh, interestingly, my name, Vikas, in my native language means development. There you go. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there, okay. Is there anybody else from this list here? No? No. Okay. Let's go to the next one then. Um, you take care of this one. Um, I think we, we, we need to do some calculation. <laughs> oh, okay, so <laughs> metal, metal is, okay, please come. Um, Liu Jie. Liu Jie is second. Third is the uh, skis. Skis is here. Ah, okay. Um, I think you already got it. So, uh, any droid with any droid? Yeah. Joe is already, he, he got it. Joe is, it, Joe is also you, right? Ah, uh, okay, keep it. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Um, um, Boaty, Mac, Bo my bold face here. No, uh, AQ craft. No, okay, then uh, thanks for everyone. So have a nice lunch. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.